assemblies of our church life, August is always the fallow period when not much happens. For most of us, therefore, August is a period when pressures on our time, at least as far as our involvement with St. Peter's is concerned, is somewhat less. And I'm particularly drawn, as a result of that, to Paul's letter to the Romans. And on that basis, there is often something to be gained by revisiting past situations. And so I dug out notes on an address I gave quite a number of years ago. And I come back to it from time to time. And they are a demand that we should offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. Paul's letter to the Romans was one of, if not the, greatest pieces of inspired writing and is rightly regarded as being amongst the most valuable expositions of the Christian faith. Unlike some of the other epistles, the authorship of Romans is undisputed. This was undoubtedly the work of Paul and his work at his best. It is a blueprint for anyone contemplating the depth of their belief or otherwise in need of some encouragement as regards their commitment to God. It has the claim of being the first well-developed theological statement by a Christian and has since had an incalculable influence on the development of the Christian church. <coughs> this is the more remarkable inasmuch as it was only ever intended as a letter to a group of Christians. It was never intended to be a carefully worded thesis, compiled with the express purpose of being the subject of detailed scholarly analytical scrutiny. But ironically, it has subsequently been so examined and found to have passed with flying colours. What we know as his epistle to the Romans was dictated by Paul to his secretary Tertius whilst in Corinth shortly before he departed on what was to be his last journey to Jerusalem. The words were taken down as they came to him. There were no spin doctors to assess and otherwise offer critique before the text was made available publicly. Paul composed his letters to address specific issues with particular people at given points in time. Nevertheless, the advice and recommendations within them have proved appropriate to others and in different circumstances, and this remains so today. Having attended churches in some capacity or other, since I was a small boy, I grew to understand the various categories of ministry, but held the view from my early teens that I would never consider being what was then known as a lay reader, as they were then known. I really couldn't see the point. But God clearly had other ideas. And in the last 25 years since my licensing, I have come to see very clearly the point of having the office of lay minister and the effective role it can play in a ministerial team, even at this very late stage of my personal involvement. At the time of my licensing, I looked upon it as an occasion with mixed emotions as the thoughts of the responsibility I had assumed began to dawn. I can say it has been an uplifting experience, charged with many joyful moments and others of immense privilege, particularly when people have entrusted me with their fears and confidences at the time of the death of loved ones. 
It was earlier in the year of my licensing that I was afforded the opportunity to preach from the pulpit. I'm not attempting to do it this morning. Um, I'm rather less agile than I was at the time of my licensing. And at that time, someone, sadly no longer with us, thought it was appropriate to leave on the lectern this. I, as you can see, I have kept it in my notes folder ever since, as I said I would at the time. It serves to remind me that we are all learners in the eyes of God. There's always something more that we can learn, regardless of age. As a preacher, it reminds me that I have still much to learn. Better late than never, they say. But for there is never any justification for displaying overconfidence any more than it is for a learner driver. Using the driving analogy again, it is only after obtaining a license can we really begin to learn to drive. We may have mastered the basics sufficiently to satisfy the examiner, but that's only just the start of the experience. The follow period, the rest period, the time out period, the month of August can be all three of these. But that does not mean it is an excuse for abstract idleness. On the contrary, why not take the spare time to reflect on what we have achieved and also that which we have not? Perhaps we might spend a little more time talking to God through the quiet periods of prayer, possibly sat in our favourite chair or in our gardens or summer houses. Asking ourselves, perhaps, how we can the better serve the Lord, for we all have talents to offer. As Paul said, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. They are Paul's words said from the heart and shown out in his life as an apostle. He led by example. We could do well to follow that example. No need for us to feel inadequate. For God to make use of us all, regardless of our failings, acknowledging that we all have gifts of some sort or other. God enables us, just as he enabled Peter. So let us use this light season to recharge our spiritual batteries and use the time to reflect and even reassess our commitment to the communal life here at St. Peter's. For we all have a part to play. In our own way, we are all ambassadors for Christ. We are all, in our own way, his disciples. have often said, and it will stand repeating yet again, we do not need to have a uniform, wear a badge, or carry a title in order to be a true disciple. Merely to offer ourselves as we are, warts and all, to the service of God. So this is my prayer again as was Paul's in his plea to the Romans, that we offer ourselves to be living sacrifices to God, dedicated to his service, and that he will indeed take each one of us, just as we are, for what we are, and make us as he would have us be, to his greater praise and glory. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we all together said... <laughs>